1990 and became the standard source and was used by NPL as a standard source for calibrating particularly neutron counters. Um, it's a desperate shame that that's lost. Um, all of this is gone now. I, I, I can imagine putting a case together for that as a, list, as a listed object, a listed building. And that's all gone, I'm afraid. <laughs> Say again? Uh, no. And in fact, actually, it wouldn't even keep the place warm. Um, for the size of that, uh, those walls are something like six feet thick. In the centre of that, it's quite a big reactor, but it's only three kilowatts. So it's only the size of an electric kettle. But uh, it's a great shame that that was actually kept running until 1990 and has now just completely been um, uh, decommissioned and the buildings have gone. Right. At the time, uh, I've got some pictures as well to show you shortly. All of the computation work at Harwell, pretty well like everybody else at the time, was done by hand. Harwell had teams of calculators, typically teams of young women, bright young women graduates, operating mechanical calculators, um, seemed to be facet calculators and some electromechanical calculators, but they're just electrically assisted mechanical calculators, um, and making a huge use of these um, mathematical tables, especially the WPA tables, produced by the Mathematical Tables Project in New York. Now, if anyone knows anything about these tables, they uh, are absolutely fantastic. Um, I bought a couple of sets of them. They were produced in New York, part of the WPA uh, program, which is some, um, generating employment for long-term unemployed people. Um, in the US at the time, and they completely de-skilled all of the, the mathematics to produce these tables. So there were teams that simply did addition, teams that did subtraction, teams that are more advanced teams that did multiplication, and separate teams for checking. So all of these tables uh, were all produced by hand. So that's all our, all our um, computers had at Harwell at the time just the tables and the uh, mechanical calculators. Just, just to put, it's slightly out of, sort of sequence, but to put it in context slightly of, of, of the period we're talking about, um, <coughs> the development of the Harwell machine took place really between, well, late 49, 50, just into 51. The red, I might hesitate doing this, I know that's red. The red section in the middle is actually when the machine was actually used in production. Um, so it's lagging the other sort of, uh, machines that we talk about particularly, the EDSAC and Manchester. Uh, it was used actually at Harwell through to 42 to 57, um, and then carried on after that. Sorry. Uh, uh, you haven't got a time scale now, you've got the time. It is, I'm afraid, just, it's, it's a bit faint. Anyway, Cambridge EDSAC was the first machine actually to do computations that people wanted the results of. Yeah. And it started doing this in May, the only problem of the year. Uh, I think it was uh, 1949. 1949 yes. it was. Yeah. May 1949. So, so somehow one of these things, Manchester maybe, yep. did not. It, 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 it had its single vowel, I don't that single huge thing, uh, but it was about came into operation doing computation about six months after the came into operation. That's in, let's say, October 1959. Well, I, 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 I stand corrected. It, was, it, it came into operation as the world's first stored program computer before REDSAC. Yes, I wouldn't argue that it was usable by any sense at that point. But it, it certainly wasn't. It sort of had one uh, tool that you could put the program in. The only way of input was by a row of push buttons. They got off a um, Spitfire spares. Uh, the only way of getting the output was copying it down off a CRT. Uh, and it had perhaps uh, 32, perhaps 
hundred, maybe two hundred bytes of store. So yep. that was not uh, a tactical communication with nope. computing. No, nope. absolutely. Uh, you you talk a little bit about it. It's a purpose. The machine wasn't in operation before Moses was in the day of 1949. One machine I'd, I, I would I'd draw your attention to, if it was kind of across any research on it, is um, a US machine developed by IBM called the Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator. And that shares an awful lot with the hardware machine we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, typical IBM, it's about 400 times the size. And our machine, when we talk about, we'll talk about six tape readers that the IBM machine had 60 odd tape readers. Back to Harwell. Uh, to, to tell you a little bit about who was in place at the time, um, the director of, uh, of uh, AER at Harwell, Sir John Cockcroft. Um, computing was looked after by Jack Howard as part of theoretical, theoretical physics, and that was managed by Klaus Fuchs. Um, we'll come back to that chap in a minute. Um, electronics division was led, uh, led by Dennis Taylor, and um, one of our team, um, who we'll come on to very shortly, is Ted Cookiabra, who certainly led the team. I, I've just realised actually I've not introduced some of the sort of team. I, at, the, at the interval, I, before the film, I've introduced some of the people that actually. Uh, pioneers in this uh, project. Now the proposal to build this machine, which was really not part of the general work flow or the work, um, plan at Harwell, was really a chance conversation between a member of the theoretical physics group and a member of the electronics group, almost over the garden wall. Um, it was a, an acute concern of some of the department heads, that they were using very, very bright people, very bright mathematicians, just to simply crank through equations and actually not using their time sensibly. Um, some of the thinking that went behind the design of the machine came about by the team, the actual designers, Ted Cookiabra, Dick Barnes, and Gurney, Gurney Thomas, visiting um, the Thursday afternoon sessions in Cambridge led by Wilkes. The case, and I can't guarantee some of the dates on the next bit, the case for actually building the machine, as I said it wasn't in the normal sort of hardware workflow, was, to, was actually made by our, our, our three designers, Ted, Dick and Gurney, um, to Cockroft and Fuchs directly. And it didn't really seem to take much time, apparently, for either Cockroft or Fuchs to actually say, that, yes, this was a good idea, and go on and get on with it. The story is that only a day, or even in fact that morning, Cockroft had actually been told that Fuchs was actually a Russian spy. So the situation you have there, at the panel deciding this, is Cockroft and Fuchs worried about their future, and certainly uh, what was going to happen next. And I've got my three designers at the front there doing a whole song and dance about designing this computer. So it's, I think they got fairly short shrift and were told to go off and actually get on with it. Did they know that at that point, three designers? Uh, my uh, designers? No, no, absolutely not. No, no. So, um, construction was actually started in early 1950 and complete and certainly working, although not handed over yet, in 1951. And that's the, there's very, very few pictures left uh, are available from Harwell, which is a, a, a real shame. And that's one of the pictures that was actually produced in, um, at the time. And in fact, it shows the machine in quite an early stage with just, excuse me for pointing, just two uh, store groups on the machine. So it must have been quite early on. Tony will talk in detail uh, about some of the machine, just to give you an idea of what comprise the machine. Um, 
Finally, with nine sets of stores, um, paper tape readers, seven paper tape readers at the side, uh, an output either to a tape perforator or to a line printer. And again, turn and I'll show you some of the pictures of those, those items. Right, I talked about the order code. It's a it was designed as a could operate as a stored program general purpose computer. Without that, um, so all the operations you would expect for there in terms of sort of the arithmetic orders and the, and the actual control orders there that you would actually expect. Um, the what are we? Typical program design. The programs were constructed on paper tape. Primarily, you would have a master paper tape with the program sequence on, and a set of subroutines that could be either off the shelf or produced on subsequent paper tape readers. And typically, so a main program on tape reader one, a stream of data all punched on five volt tape on tape reader two, and any number of subroutines as loops of paper tape on the subsequent readers. So typically you'd start with the machine with a bootstrap built in, which would search for the first block on tape reader one, and actually start executing instructions from that um, tape reader. Typically, the programs that we've looked at, that, um, that we have copies of, first job they would actually do is clear the stores, clear the Decadron stores, and then optionally copy any subroutine blocks. So those subroutines that are actually on loops of paper tape, copy them actually into the store. So, we're not, so we can actually execute programs from the store, not just on loops of tape. The main, data tape, the main uh, program tape would then carry on reading data and processing data and calling out to subroutines either on tape or actually in store. And, and then obviously carry on either to the next job on the master tape or to stop. And a bit more detail. That's an example. I must say much of this is actually on the website as well with examples. So that would be, um, this is one of the programs that was done as a sort of test program uh, for the machine. And it just simply puts a, a table of squares. So we start at the top with the bootstrap, clearing the stores that we're going to use, setting up the data, initial data values from one of the data tapes, transferring control to another tape reader, and that's the loop that we're actually going to execute as we print each line out on the report. It was handed over to Jack Howard's team and the computers the, uh, the, the, the actual uh, people working in Jack Cullen's team in May 52. And we've been uh, able to get in touch with one of the people that worked in that team, um, talking about just the excitement of this machine with its um, subroutine paper tape readers made out of Meccano. Now, I can assure you the tape readers aren't made out of Meccano, but we actually can't identify where they were made at all. So if anyone, went, when you see some of the pictures that um, Tony's got shortly, can identify what they are, it would be quite, quite useful. Um, so the machine was handed over in May 1952. And typically, typically its job was to produce tables, a bit like the mathematical tables, that, that the pre-printed mathematical tables that they were using already. Um, now I'm not a mathematician, I'm not going to go in this particularly. It's not a fast machine, absolutely not a fast machine. This, this solution from this differential equation, that's the um, effect of the output of this program. Each line of that takes five minutes to calculate. So this is really a very, very slow machine, but it's very, as we'll see later on, it's a very reliable machine. So it's a bit of a case of the sort of whore, the, um, the, the, the tortoise and the hare. So it's very slow, but incredibly reliable and would often be left weekends and, and, and weeks on end grinding through problems. But yes, very slow. There's a nice line here. Again, uh, that's Jack Howler on the right and Bart Fossey, who actually led the computers on the left-hand side. And Bart Fossey uh, was very, very good, very, very quick and actually settled down for a sort of a race with the machine. I managed to keep up with him for half an hour, which give, he was using a mechanical calculator at that point, which gives you an idea of how fast the machine was. But of course, he gave up 
uh, exhausted after half an hour, and the machine just ploughed on. The machine was designed to actually take, take the place of a small team, five or six um, operators using mechanical calculators. From May 52 to February 53, it was running pretty well 80 hours of that. Well, wait, wait, in fact, there was a period of five weeks due to damage to the machine, but apart from that, it was running 55% of the available time. And in one of the reports uh, about the machine that, took, uh, that um, Ted Cook Yarborough produced in 53, we're talking then that it, it can only actually be a useful time, a, a useful machine, if you could spend that much time on the job, uh, 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 on those, on those programmes. Some, it, it, I've heard it mentioned slightly disingenuously that it had to be a reliable machine because it was that so slow, if it wasn't reliable it wouldn't have actually been any use at all, but it was desperately a reliable machine. And again another comment from Jack Howlett, uh, this was absolutely not unusual at all, um, although we can't, I can't get quite all of the details about this, I'm not sure about Jack Howlett's comment, Jack says with miles of input tape, miles of input data, on paper tape. That's typically not the way it was used. I think it, that's possibly being misremembered. But it was not unusual for the machine to be left for long periods to carry on like that. There are certain parts of the machine that if an error occurs or, or something happens, it will actually retry the job up to three times. If, if it still fails, it can carry on to the next job on the master program tape. And we come to the machine's first retirement. Uh, it went, it was transferred to the computers and used live in 52 and was retired in 1957. Now, the designers, obviously, the, the engineers obviously moved on in the meantime and in 55 they produced the cadet machine, which if you read those letters backwards, it actually does make sense. And the cadet in 55 was really the first, was the first, world's first, the UK's first transistorized, completely transistorized, general purpose computer. Um, they were using punch card equipment, this BTM uh, 555 machine 52, and of course then they had access to faster machines, including Atlas and Stretch, at uh, the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment at Aldermaston. So our machine was first retired in 1957. L. The first stroke of, oh, sorry, actually it's a predi um, picture of the actual cadet machine. And unfortunately all of that machine seems to have been lost. It's shown there as a, um, a laboratory project. The intention was to rebuild it all as a sort of 18 inch cube. Uh, it's a drum based machine, I think you can see the drum in the middle. Um, and it's a shame that's lost. Rather than dismantle the machine in 57, John Hammersley, who was working at Harvard at the time, in combination with the Oxford Mathematical Institute, started a competition that was available to all further education bodies, uh, primarily colleges, um, to submit an application um, to actually take the machine over. And there were 30 submissions, 30 separate colleges actually applied for this, and a short list of nine uh, was produced. Tell you a little bit about John Hammersley. He was absolutely passionate about teaching of mathematics. Um, in uh, I see some nods of people know him. Passionate about uh, <laughs> teaching mathematics, and in some of the research I've done about it, I came across the title of one of his papers. And that's the title of his paper at the bottom. And so he, he, this chap really did not pull his punches at all, and you can see the level. I, I, I absolutely love that. It has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but I, re I in reading his list of published papers, I came across that, and I thought that's absolutely priceless. So John organised the, the, the competition. Uh, from the short list of nine, the short, the, the, each of the, the colleges actually made a presentation at Harwell, with some of them arriving with their sort of Lord Mayor and chains of office and so on. But the winner, competition was Wolverhampton and Staffordshire College of Technology and they put together the uh, the best case. 
Now, we've, again, we've got um, copies of all of the um, articles, the, the, the newspaper articles at the time, and that's from the Wolverhampton Express and Star. Just picking some of the lines out of the, um, the, 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 the press item that they did, they were very, very proud of themselves, obviously rightly, for winning the machine. I'm not sure they quite understood what they'd actually won. Um, <laughs> I quite like the line about you can, for instance, work out wage calculations much quicker than human beings. I think that's rather pushy, it's likely. Um, and they didn't make the point. In fact, the only commercial computer that was available from the time would have been Pegasus, which they reckon at the time would have cost between 50 and 60,000 pounds. So they're very, very proud of this machine. When it was commissioned, actually, Wolverhampton, it was given a name for the first time. Rather than the Harwell computer or the Harwell Deck Control computer, it was called the Witch, the Wolverhampton Instrument for Teaching Computing from Harwell. And again, another the, 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 the pride that the college had in actually having this machine uh, was another, another uh, item, a fact from the Birmingham Post this time. They used the machine to actually instigate their first undergraduate course in computing. And that was in 1965. Again, one of the books that they produced at the same time to go with the machine was primarily an introduction to numerical analysis, but it's also um, a, quite a complete description of how the machine was used and some example programs as well. Part of the bid that Wolverhampton um, put together to Harwell was with support from local industry and they talked about local industry being able to use the machine and there was some financial support as well. One of the companies that supported them was the Chubb Lock Company who were based in Wolverhampton and Chubb commissioned them to write a program to help them work out combinations for lever locks. There are certain formats of, of um, locks which aren't technically strong enough um, I don't run out all the details at all, but going back to some of the the, um, the research we've done, this like this picture uh, was printed in the Wolverhampton Express and Star with the caption that the chap on the left is Peter Burden and the chap on the right is Frank Hawley. Peter Burden, it said, was a Wolverhampton grammar school boy who was uh, using the machine in his summer holidays before going up to read mathematics at Cambridge. Uh, which, which is actually quite true. He was um, he'd been on a course to see the machine from um, Wolverhampton Grammar School, and in the, the vacation before going up to Cambridge, had written to the college and said, "Can I come actually and come and use this machine?" And he was given the job of um, programming the job key problem. Peter then went off to uh, to Cambridge, read maths, taught maths for a couple of years in schools and then actually went back to Wolverhampton College to teach their undergraduate computing course, still using the witch. Um, and, and again, we, we, we've been and interviewed Peter. They, at this point, they started making modifications to the machine, which Tony will cover, but if you, if you look at the top corner of the machine there, you can just about see a patch panel. And they started making modifications to the machine so they could actually alter the print layout. The print layout of the machine was very fixed um, and they started making modifications to, to um, accommodate particularly the chop key problem. <coughs> 1967, it's been actually in service then for 10 years at the college and uh, a 10 your service sort of uh, anniversary lunch was set up again, and again it was covered in the uh, Wolverhampton Express and Star and I'm very pleased to say that chap there, you know, smart young chap on the third in from the left is one of the original designers and that Dick's Dick Barnes and Dick Barnes is in the audience with us today. Um, I'm not sure if you can read some of the actual the, um, the planned discussions and the, the planned papers that were read. It's a bit contrived. Welcome to the coffin. I married a witch. Trials and tribulations. How to make a witch. And then the founder witch at the end. But again, um, they, 
desperately, desperately proud of this machine. Right, now 1973. So 1973 is the, the machine's third retirement. Uh, it's been working for 22 years at um, Wolverhampton at that stage. One of the reasons they give for the retirement is it's increasing unreliability. And I think we'll see when uh, Tony talks that some of the techniques they used to actually maintain the machine weren't ideal. By which stage also they'd actually bought an IBM machine for the college and they had a 1900, I think it was a 1904. And on the day, on the retirement day, which was actually filmed by the local TV station, local, uh, ATV as it was, the IBM machine played a tune apparently and the 1900s, or specifically the line printer at least, produced some artwork especially for the day. The machine also was then actually submitted to the Guinness Book of Records as the world's most durable computer, and that, and that record still stands with gifts. And it's actually you know, it's listed in the 1963, uh, 1973 Guinness Book of Records. Now, it's rather than, again, rather than being dismantled uh, and destroyed, it was actually sent to Birmingham Science Museum. Now, that's a very, very unflattering picture, I'm afraid, of Birmingham Science Museum. Uh, that's just really just, it's all I could find is the front entrance. The museum actually was pretty huge. It went a long, long way back, down alongside one of the canals. And that, sorry? Pardon? It's directly over the canal, isn't it? Well, it was. In fact, some of it was built over a, a canal, apparently, that they actually filled in. Okay, but I thought, I remember going in it and seeing Well, it's um, 1973 when there. Now, I, I grew up in Birmingham, and I did my A-levels in about 79. And I remember the machine at the Birmingham Science Museum. I'm the sort of person that went to the Birmingham Science Museum every Saturday afternoon and knew absolutely everything was there at all. This machine was on display. Um, to my knowledge, it was never actually displayed working. Uh, some people, some of the um, people that remember the machine being there, and it possibly was, but pretty much, almost certainly not. I don't think. Uh, I was kept on display until 1997, um, when Birmingham City Council closed down the museum. If anybody remembers, and, and Terry just mentioned it as well, uh, I don't have any pictures of the machine actually in use, but that might remind you what the upstairs at the Science Museum was like. Second floor of the Science Museum had a huge reactor, uh, a huge model of a Magnox power station, and behind it was a relay-based machine that played the draft game uh, Fox and Geese, and then the whole machine was there. The ground floor was just where the, uh, the steam engines were. Um, that was taken in 2006, and unfortunately that's all gone there. So when the Science Museum, Bowman Science Museum was closed down, again it was saved, it went off to um, Birmingham Museum's Collection Centre. This is in Char Charlotte Street in Birmingham City Centre. Uh, um, really not um, an ideal place at all. Um, really, it's a fairly ramshackle warehouse that leaked more off, um, more places than it didn't leak. And the machine was completely dismantled um, and left there. It's sitting in a, um, a sort of crate here at the moment. All of, the, all of the actual uh, relay racks and uh, stores are taken off the, um, the racks there. Um, but it survived that, it survived that, and then went to the new, very, very smart Birmingham Museum's Collection Centre, again near the city centre. Now this is, this is an absolutely fantastic place. It's um, fairly huge very, very well organised, very well organised if they understand what they're keeping in this collection centre. They're very good at keeping cars, pretty well everything that Austin Rover ever produces kept there. <laughs> Just an aside for anyone that grew up in Birmingham, on the floor there you can see the word source. And that's the source that came when they dismantled the HP Source factory in Birmingham City Centre. <laughs> So all that was actually kept was the, the source from the bottom. Um, their cars and steam engines are beautifully arranged and shown. Their computers are all lumped together. Now, you can just see, um, some of you might recognise, there's an Orion um, 
Frontier Iron uh, computer at the front. There's, and I've forgotten where this disk drive is from now. I'm looking for DIG, actually. <laughs> yes, I think it's from the Atlas II at the Cad Center. The Atlas II at the Cambridge Cad Center, the disk drive. There's a, a Power Summers 558 just on the right hand side. And right at the back, at the top, I think just there, you can see some of the racks from the hardware machine. Um, to get at the hardware machine at this point remo required moving all of that other equipment away from it. And uh, I, I, I'll show you the sort of timeline that we went through shortly. Um, we, we're absolutely uh, sure that we hadn't found everything. We might have found a few racks. We were thinking if we find a few racks, then potentially we could rebuild the rest. Um, but by the time we cleared all of this out, we actually found the bulk of the processor. This point, it, prior to this point, it's always been just purely a research project. It was a machine that I was interested in, wanted to know a little bit about its history, and then really wasn't expecting to find the machine at all. Uh, so we had to start then asking some sort of quite difficult questions. If, as we hope, we can actually restore this machine, because had we found all or sufficient parts of the hardware, did we have any access at all to the manual? Or, or, or to the diagrams of the machine at all. Are the original designers or users or programmers able to help? Are, are any of them still with us or, or willing to help? Um, do, we have everything, do we have everything we need to actually restore the machine? Which is the people, the skills, the time, the, the money to do it and, and the space to do it. And obviously not, these aren't specific to the hardware machine at all. What would be the eventual plan for the machine? And should we even actually attempt the project? We actually have to do this. Well, we had some luck. We found this is an example. None of this, none of the components of the machine are cat were catalogued in the Museum Storage Centre at all. So one of my colleagues, who we'll see shortly, Johan, stood literally on the front of a forklift truck, and they drove him down, up and down the aisles, getting higher and higher and higher from shelf to shelf, with Johan pointing out, that looks likely, and then bringing that tray down, and we're looking at it and deciding either it was useful or it wasn't useful. This was fantastic. This, um, it's the sort of size of a pallet. Um, I've put some of the things up. It has, we've taken a couple of layers off. The top layer had all the circuit diagrams and the theory of operation of the machine, which is unbelievable. This layer we get to at the moment is primarily spares, for relay sets and valves, I think. And I can't see, ah, uh, I think, I think in these boxes there, um, had loops of paper tape and original, and original tapes. All the tapes actually that were produced at Wolverhampton. Nothing seems to have been found, uh, well no, we haven't found anything from when the machine was used at Harwell, uh, including that box there, which when we, opened, when we took it out of this pallet, had written on the side the chub key problem. Sadly, it, it, it wasn't actually, that's not what was in there at all. We, we still have hopes of finding it. Um, now, this is, this is fantastic. Uh, this absolutely, I think this really made our mind up that, in fact, we, we, we could do this. We had the processor, we had these spares, we had the circuit diagrams, even better than circuit diagrams, we had courtesy of Dick Barnes, an explanation of how the machine actually operated. Our next stroke of luck, courtesy of uh, the late Peter Hall, was being put in touch with Ted Cook Yarbrough, who led the team, and, and, and most importantly with Dick Barnes, who really, I think, actually did all of the work as far as we could uh, well, we reckon he did all the work anyhow. Um, and in March 2009, um, Tony and Johan and I went to see Ted Cook Yarbrough and Dick Barnes to take them the results of our research and really ask their opinion and their, their blessing on, on restoring the machine, this machine. And of course, I'm actually very enthused about that. Um, so, in, in May 2009, we, put the, we made a proposal to the CCS that this um, could be a new working party and a new restoration project. And then we put the proposal into the Birmingham Museum's Collection Centre. 
very detailed proposal about what we wanted to do with the machine and why. That went in the 15th of May. And we didn't hear a word from them at all until the end of July. Um, we really had no idea how they felt about the machine, how they felt about the projects like this. Uh, but on um, completing out of the bill, on the 28th of July, we received a note saying, yes, you can go ahead, you can have the machine to, re to restore it with the specific aim of restoring it to working order and then transfer the machine to, to the museum at Bletchley. And things moved fairly quickly from then on. We went back to Birmingham on the 24th, 24th of August, and in fact that's when we found that um, crate of spares. Also at that point we found all the tape readers that we didn't, and the line printer, uh, the page printers that we didn't think we'd find. Um, the CCS were very kind to award us a grant to actually physically move the machine from Birmingham to Bletchley and that was agreed on the 27th of August and on the 3rd of September it arrived at the museum. Now, I can show you a video of it arriving. I'm afraid it's me again. Um, <coughs> let's see if I can make this big. It's a machine from the late 1940s, at a time when there were very, very few machines being developed. Um, this particular machine is important to us because it is the last complete surviving machine from that period. And it's, it's intact. I mean, all of it's coming off the, off the, the divan here at the moment. Uh, we've managed to trace, and this has been three years now of doing the research, we've managed to trace all of the components of the machine. It was developed in the early days of Harwell, um, developing the sort of very first nuclear uh, and atomic power stations uh, for the UK. And at that time, all calculations, all mathematical calculations were done by people with mechanical calculators. And it was, some of the calculations would take days and days to do. Um, so this machine was developed, not to be the fastest computer in the world at the time, but to be a relentless, reliable machine. Between the power supply and this rack, there's a rack that was the... Um Where's the memory gear? Which is the memory? We dismantled this very carefully when it was in storage, just so we could move it more easily, uh, and, and to make sure that we didn't actually damage any of the components. Um, so all we've done at the moment is reassembled it back onto the racks. Um, it's all in the correct place at the moment, so all of the items are actually on there. We haven't obviously had a chance to, to do any testing at all at the moment. We have a limited uh, amount of documentation. We have all the original circuit diagrams, which is of course absolutely fantastic. We have some pictures that were taken both at Harwell when it was built and when it was used at Wolverhampton College of Technology. And we're looking at those pictures just at this stage to make sure that we're actually counting the number of memory units, the number of relay racks, and we have the actual racks in the right position. Right. Um, as a CCS, we've been talking a lot recently about um, computer history and the writing of computer history. And uh, there are basically three roles. Um, the computer historian, the practitioner, and the pioneer. I'm pleased to say we have two absolute originals here. We have a, 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 a genuine practitioner, and a genuine pioneer, and I'm the fake, I'm the fake computer historian, I'm afraid. Um, as I said, Dick Barnes is with us as the, as the pioneer, as the designer of the machine. But I'd like to hand over now to, um, to Tony, Tony and his team, which is Johan and Eddie, who are all, all here today, uh, look after the actual restoration of the machine. And I forgot when the machine actually arrived, <laughs> having said that on that day. September. That's September. So, um, Tony's worked phenomenally hard, not helped by me saying, initially saying, oh, it should be working with that doubt in 18 months' time. And I keep bringing that date now and down and down and down. So every time he shows me something else working, I think, oh, no problem, I'll have this working in no time. Um, if I start Tony's slides off, and I think we should transfer the microphone to you. Oh, 
Oh, right. Yeah. Actually, before I get started, <laughs> Frank Lewis, oh. Oh. can I in introduce you to the other two members of the team who are here? Do you want to come up and uh, say hello? <laughs> right, this is uh, Johan, Johan Iverson, and Eddie Washington, both of whom are working on the uh, on the Harlow Decatron computer, and whenever they have time available. Um, they're both featured in the presentation, so I'll, I'll talk more about them as I go through. Thank you. Right. right, actually, before I get started, um, I'll talk a little bit about that day in September when I went up to um, Birmingham Collection Centre um, in, in advance of the uh, lorry that was coming to collect the computer, the Carrigentry lorry, which that is. Um, there's a specialist haulage firm that we use for, for moving um, prized possessions around. Um, we've had previous uh, experience of using them, so to, you know, we knew who, uh, what we were dealing with. Anyway, on the first two occasions that I went to Birmingham Collection Centre, I got hopelessly lost because it's in um, sort of the back streets of Birmingham, and I don't have a, a sat nav in the car. And so on the third occasion, having to be there early in the morning by a particular time, I borrowed Johan's sat nav to ensure that I, I got there ahead of the lorry and we didn't have any um, hitches. Now, a, an advantage to that was, as, as Kevin's mentioned, um, Johan spent quite a lot of time going backwards and forwards on the, uh, on the forklift truck up and down the the aisles of the collection centre, trying to find parts of the machine that we knew exist, or like, were likely to exist, um, but we hadn't found in our initial visit. Um, and our initial visit, we found, we found the racks, they're obviously big and obvious, um, but we didn't find the, um, the, the peripherals, the input-output organs of the machine. Um, I also knew that there were some spares at Wolverhampton, including a substantial hoard of uh, Decatron tubes which, you know, if they were around, we wanted them. Um, so we spent some time searching, and we found pretty much everything that we wanted, but we knew we didn't have the interconnect cables, or at least the ones that we found, we, there was some doubt as to whether they were the ones for the machine. Um, they did seem to have plessy connectors on, but there were lots of sort of coaxial cables as well, which um, uh, were likely from something else. So we put those to one side, thinking, well, if, if we can't find ones that are definitely for the machine, we'll, we'll take those anyway and sort through them and hope for the best. But as I say, I arrived at the collection centre nice and early, and the carriage entry lorry was actually delayed slightly due, due to traffic. And so the, the um, forklift driver said, well, there was an aisle that we didn't look in on our previous visit. And sure enough, we looked in that, in that aisle, up and up behind was a big box, uh, with something completely different in, but on top of the box were coiled up all of the cables for, for the hardware machine. And we knew that because they had little um, little tags on them um, with, with, with um, little bits of punched card, basically, that the, 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 the determinations had been scribbled on as to where the, those particular wires go. And also, um, the cables are a distinctive brown colour, which I, I knew from the photographs of short cables that we had. Uh, with the sort that we were looking for. So that was a really lucky break that the lorry was delayed and I actually got there on time. So, um, having, well, on, the, on, the, on the previous uh, visit, we'd actually taken the racks of the machine and put them in the loading bay, carried gently then loaded them onto the lorry without any hitches. Um, we'd taken all of the, um, the various removable modules, like the stores, uh, the, the, the relay units and so forth, off and put them into pallets for storage. Um, just in case there were any problems with um, with loose, you know, things working loose in transit. Anyway, um, I, I got a, back to eventually ahead of the lorry, which wasn't really difficult. And uh, there's the lorry in our car park, waiting to manoeuvre to reverse up to our loading bay. And there's myself and Kevin and Ben Trethone waiting anxiously for the, for the machine to uh, to appear from the, the rear of the lorry. And of course, this is largely covered in, in the video that, uh, that Kevin's just shown. There it is, firmly strapped in place. And uh, the arrival was filmed by the BBC Technology website, Mark Ward and his cameraman, who is coincidentally from, this, we are from the same hometown, Morpeth, <laughs> so that we were talking. 
Uh, there's the power supply uh, rack being moved into the into the uh, loading bay there, and yeah, that's the first unit position. Uh, this is this is really um, uh, still taken at the same time the video was taken. Right, um, this is the rack of. Uh, is made of Dexy, and evidently at Wolverhampton um, there was a chap called Charlie Uzzle who was a dab hand with Dexian, and um, he, he built various little uh, pieces of framework and so forth. There was a, a small frame for the oscilloscope. Um, there, there's the frame for the uh, for the tape readers. Um, when the machine actually went to uh, to Wolverhampton, it actually has nine store units. Um, now eight of those were, um, were were accommodated on the machine. But um, because Wolverhampton were given a spare store, and the machine has the capability of addressing, um, up, well, to include that within its, within its address space, they built a little Dexian extension to the machine and plopped the store on the end. And of course, that's a very distinctive feature, visual feature of the machine, so, so we're stuck with it. Um, anyway. <laughs> right, that's, um, again, these haven't been moved into position yet. That is the page printer. It's a Creed Model 7 something or other. Um, it's got an acoustic hood on it, which is very considerate back in those days. Uh, I remember the dot matrix printers in the office with, uh, with acoustic hoods on. And uh, a Creed teletype, which has apparently been specially modified because the, the character code that the witch uses, or the computer, which is much more catchy, um, is quite different from the, um, the, the telecommunications um, standard code. So um, we we'll hope, we'll hope to, to get that particular one working. A couple of volunteers there. Actually, there was a very good turnout of volunteers on the day the machine arrived. Uh, there's a lens student, Bob Jones, uh, examining the machine, getting their first look at it. Um, what, what, what you'll also notice from this photograph, but not on subsequent photographs, are that um, the, the machine was protected by um, quite a number of these um, Perspex covers. And of course, it was used in a, an educational environment, and therefore uh, it was necessary to keep uh, uh, prying fingers out of the out of the uh, machine, uh, particularly in light of the uh, the kind of voltages that we're looking at here, uh, where the supply rails are between um, plus 370 and minus 385 volts. Uh, it's obviously um, quite a, quite a hazard. And actually, as we've got the machine on display, we have a barrier in front of it um, uh, as well for when we're, we're doing testing. There's that box again. Actually, one thing when Kevin was describing it that, 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 that to note is it's a bit of a deceptive view. This is actually two boxes taped together, and below all of these valves were about 130 decatron tubes, all boxed up um, in, in various conditions. But I'll talk a little bit more about the decatrons later on. As you can see, there are, there are tape um, spools of, of tape. Of, um, uh, printed pr um, ribbons for the for the printer. Um, there's a lot of extenders, uh, U-point extenders, so you can work on on units off the rack, uh, powered up. There's an extender there for um, for the modules that the carry units and shift units, which I'll talk about as well later on. Right, uh, and the, of course the the, the big. Uh, bonus with, with all of this is that we found a set, and we already had a set of uh, schematics of the machine, but this particular set has an awful lot of annotations on it, including things like dodgy connector, um, waveforms, lots of voltage measurements and, and so forth, which will be invaluable when, when we come to actually uh, do preliminary tests on the various units. Um, so it's a, it's a genuine working engineer's uh, document that, that uh, it contains a lot of very useful information. And I remember when we first spoke with, uh, with Dick Barnes, when we, when we met um, uh, Ted Kukiabra and Dick uh, a year or so ago, um, he was asking, do you have the accompanying notes that go with it? Because it would be very difficult to, uh, especially in the relay circuitry, where the schematics are, 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 are in the main schematics of particular units rather than functional blocks um, to, to work out exactly what's happening and why uh, things are wired up the, the way they are. And 
There they are. <laughs> they are all original uh, typed documents. Um, there is a document for the primary sequences, secondary sequences, tape input output. All of the major functions of the machine are described in detail. Um, you can actually, well, it's, it's actually at that, at that level of uh, focus here, but basically the, the kind of wording is very much that the signals are switched through various, an earth is made through various particular relay contacts and so forth. So if you have a schematic alongside this, you can very easily follow um, what it's doing um, for, for any particular purpose. And we've been able to glean our understanding of, of how the machine sequenced uh, uh, and how it all operates by following these, uh, these through against the schematic diagrams. So that was a really good find. Ah, right. Shortly, very shortly after the machine arrived, um, Dick was in touch saying, I, I've got to come and see the machine. And he was very anxious to, um, to, to come and see the machine and had planned his coach trip um, from, from Abingdon uh, to, to come and see it. And of course, uh, Kevin gave him, gave him a lift in the end. Um, but there's Kevin, um, Dick Barnes and Ros Many, who's in the audience also, uh, Dick's daughter. Um, seeing the machine at, in the museum for the first time. That's actually a rear view of the machine, uh, so you can see all the, all the wiring. Also, shortly after that, a further visit from um, Dick Barnes and Maureen, who's also with us today, his wife, and uh, Gurney Thomas, one of the other designers uh, who is responsible for the, the Decatron side of the machine. Um, so that was, a, that was another great day as well. Um, Cecil Ramsbottom, who was a lecturer and, and then head of department at, uh, at Wolverhampton and looked after the machine, um, his son, well actually this is, this, this, <laughs> these are two of his sons and one of his daughters, the other daughter, Frances Badger, isn't actually here, although we'd, we'd already been in touch with her and she'd sent us um, a quite a lot of, uh, of, paper, of papers that uh, Cecil had put to one side. Um, anyway, one of the things that, that, that they had was, um, from Cecil's study, this plaque which is a picture of the machine, um, a, a, a sort of prototype of, of, the, of, the, of the witch, uh, which you can't actually see there, it's sort of black and white, whereas the one on the machine is white and black, and the key for the, um, the control unit as well, which we've taken copies of, and hopefully we'll, we'll return the, the original to, uh, to um, fill in due course. Uh, his, his other brother is an electronics engineer, and he was asking lots of very probing questions just to make sure that we knew what we were doing with his father's machine. Right, that's the machine as you see it um, pretty much today at uh, the National Museum of Computing. We've got a, an area at the back of one of the halls where, um, which used to house the Colossus machines in the wall, so it's a, it's a team good, co good company there. Um, with about three bays at the back. And we have our restoration area behind there. So we've got desks set up and test equipment and so forth. Right. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the, the paper tapes that we found. Um, and here's an example of one of the tape readers. Uh, in this case, we've, we've just put on a small tape loop, just a bit of nonsense really which um, uh, we, can, we can use to illustrate to people that you can have uh, the main program loaded on one tape reader, subroutines loaded on the other, and possibly data tapes on, 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 other, tape, on other tape readers. Um, one of the problems with, with these tape readers is that they are mechanical. Uh, and uh, if you run a small tape loop through the, uh, the reader um, 500 or so times, then it will eventually become unreadable as, as the holes will pull. Um, apparently you can, you can copy them by reversing them and um, put it, copy them back to front so that you don't, you're not actually copying the pull there, pull the side of the hole. Um, but as these were made from, from paper, uh, obviously they would have a limited life and it's partly for that reason you would want to load a subroutine into store and run from there. Um, another um, suggestion in, in some of the notes we have is that you might want to prepare a much longer tape with several copies of the subroutine on um, so that it wasn't running through as many times. 
right, here, here are those pictures of the, of the mystery tape readers. We're, we're very puzzled as to, as to who the manufacturer of these were, were, was. That there are no obvious maker's marks on them. Um, it's a very simple, elegant mechanism. Basically, um, the, the, the face, the bottom face of the tape reader has a U-point which just uh, mates with, with one of the, on the, on the, on the plinth that it mounts onto. Um, there's a, a rod that moves through with a, um, a switch on it which can be used to engage or disengage the mechanism. Uh, this solenoid basically drives a, a pole and ratchet to, every time it energises it moves the tape through one um, Position onto the next uh, next um, character. Uh, we haven't actually powered powered them up yet, so we've just been looking at the mechanism. But as you can see, there aren't any any marks on them. There's a picture of the top the top mechanism showing the, 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 the these are like a like a, like a, um, a pivot. The, these uh, have have the pins which push through the uh, the tape to sense it, and the pole ratchet is is, is it, Within that area, there, these are the these are the contacts which which will then um, con uh, conduct the whether whether the, t the pins gone through the hub or back to the computer. Room. Right. Um, Kevin pointed out in that big box that, um, that, that, that we had a lot of uh, tapes. Many of them were lying loose in the box. Uh, there were also ones that had been put in um, in photographic paper boxes and in those brown. Um, boxes that, that you saw. Um, but one, there were ones neatly stored in small tubs which have obviously protected them. Some tape made of a what appears to be like a plasticised fabric. Um, we, have, we haven't seen them like, like that before but obviously they'd be much more resistant to, to tearing and also these have been fi uh, filed with their, with their listings as well. There's one uh, made a uh, former made of part of a shoebox. Uh, <laughs> the, the disadvantage with these ones are that you get folds, and as paper has been folded, and uh, obviously that's, there's a risk of it uh, tearing when, when reading it. Fortunately, a lot of the tapes have descriptions of um, what the tape is for. In this case, square root demonstration. Uh, the x value is loaded into store 30 root of x in 31, a constant 0.5 in store 32, and it prints the result on uh, uh, organ 03. So, uh, but you can see how discoloured the tape is, and obviously that means it's brittle. Um, right, uh, we've set up a little rig here for, for recovering software. Uh, of the 200-ish um, tapes that we've found that came with the machine, We've been able to read, I would say, something in the order of 180 of them. There are still one or two that are causing us problems. Um, our initial attempt to read the, read the tapes, um, we had problems which we thought were attributable to translucency of the, of the paper. Um, and what it seems to be is that the one, we, st we started reading the ones that were loose in the box and they had fine dust on them. And we found that by cleaning the heads, or dusting the tape before we read it, that we were getting much better results. Um, very noddy VB program there, just capturing the data from the RS232 from the tape reader. Um, we, we have uh, uh, recovered the uh, 180 text files, which uh, uh, do we have them loaded on the website, Kevin? Oh, well, anyway, you know that the information's available. We haven't actually started uh, looking at them in anger yet to. Uh, to, to figure out what's going on, but we've we've got uh, we've, reco we've we've recovered the, the tapes basically at this point. Sorry, I should have mentioned that's an optical tape reader, <laughs> and we were running it through on the slowest speed, which I think is 110 board. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> it's quite an unusual machine. Uh, obviously, we only build one of them. But it's, it's a marriage of three different technologies. Uh, relays, that Stroudger 3000 series, um, same as, as you would find in, in telephone exchanges or on, Coloss on the Colossus computer. Um, hard vacuum valves used in the arithmetic unit. 
and decatrons used for storage and in the accumulator. Um, at the museum, I tend to explain to people how it works in terms of a mechanical calculator, because it's very much as if you'd re reverse engineered a mechanical calculator, worked out how it works, and then re-implemented it in electronics with a few um, additional features built on. Um, so, so um, yeah, orders, orders, loaded from paper tape may be executed from stores, although that wasn't typically how the machine was used, or that, that, that it does have that capability. Um, Kevin mentioned that uh, it has a, a number of, of features uh, to support unattended operation. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, there is, uh, I think one of the problems they had at Wolverhampton when they first used it, they turned on the computer, then thought, well, what should we do next? In the meantime, the computer turned itself off. And they went through this cycle a few times before, before they decided to read the instructions. Um, the, the other feature it has, it has an, an error detecting mechanism, um, which, is, which is quite clever actually and very simple. Um, there is a, a geared motor, which, which with a cam on it, that goes around once every 30 seconds and operates a set of uh, spring contacts and generating a pulse. Now when it starts an operation, it does so when, on, on the, when that pulse occurs. Now, the longest operations on the machine are multiplication and division, which typically take about 15 seconds. So, if it is still trying to do that calculation, when, that, no, when the next pulse comes along 30 seconds later, it knows it's lost the plot. And um, it, it loses a life, basically. And now it can lose three lives before it gives up. So it'll retry a couple of times, and, and then uh, give up and I believe it sounds the horn um, if that occurs. <laughs> so, so it's very much designed for unattended operation. It'll, it'll shut itself down if it's not being used or if it's completed the task, um, and it will call for help if, if, it, if it gets stuck. Um, but, but another thing, of course, it, it's quite a green machine. Um, but despite the fact it, it appears to have a lot of valves, most of those are the decatrons, which are cold cathode tubes. Uh, and run at a very low current, a, low, a lower holding current. I think a whole store, we measured something like 12 milliamps, um, which, is, which is much lower than I expected. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have a master clock as such, like a modern digital computer would have. Um, it, it basically has, um, well, the, the overall log logic of the machine is controlled by the relay relays. Um, uh, one of the units is a, is a relay sequencer, primary sequence. And it goes through three different states. Um, first of all, it clears down the previous order, then it'll load the order it want, it's going to execute, and then execute. So it's clear, load, execute. Um, and when it's going through, uh, say, an, an execute cycle, it will hand off to um, a secondary sequence um, to perform the appropriate arithmetic operation, for example. Um, when an arithmetic operation completes, it will then signal back order completed and move on to the next state. So the machine is, is, is self-timed basically by, by virtue of the, of the speed of the relay operation. Um, arithmetic operations um, are, are governed by the, 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 the pulse generator. What, what there is basically is quite a complex valve circuit which uses a decatron uh, tube as well to produce trains of pulses. Now I'll talk a little bit more about how decatrons work um, hopefully without getting too heavily technical, um, uh, shortly. But, but basically, um, judging by the, the size of these, the mark space of these pulses, these pulse trains, um, it, it's a bit like turning the handle on the, on the hand crank calculator 33.3 uh, times per second maximum. <laughs> oh, there's the hand crank calculator. Um, when I describe the machine, there are various parallels between the, the, the hand crank calculator and the machine itself. Uh, I've, I've just mentioned the, the pulse generator, which is very much like turning the handle. Um, the, the stores, are, are, each store is, is very much like a row of decatrons there holding the value. There, there's a shift unit um, and the accumulator. So there are a lot of parallels with a, with a mechanical calculator. Right, um, we have six tape readers. I, I showed them earlier 
uh, on, a, on, the, on the Dexian rack. We've mounted them on a, on a table for convenience, and that's how they have them uh, set up at, at Harwell. There's um, an auxiliary uh, control panel, which is a much cut down control panel. The idea being that you could operate uh, the machine from a separate room. Uh, there's quite a long coil of cables that allows you to place the tape readers and the um, reperforator and, uh, and page printer in a separate room. Right, that's the, the reperforator, which is a Creed Model 7. Um, we have a, fortunately, uh, one, of, one of our volunteers at Bletchley Park uh, who has had quite a bit of experience in, in restoring Creed equipment. Now, he's, a, he's a busy chap, so he hasn't had a chance to, to look at these yet um, in any great detail, but we have similar um, equipment already, which has successfully got working. And there's the page printer, which is alongside it. Right. Um, I don't know if Kevin had a slide showing the machine, showing diagrammatically um, uh, how the machine was organised. Um, we've got the, the six tape readers here. This is the power supply rack, which comprises the 50 volt supply, uh, which powers the, the relays. These are all relays in these cans here. Um, there's a distribution unit, which um, supplies 6 volt supply to the lamps. Um, it also um, has all the fuses. Each, each individual shelf of relays has its own fuse, which will be really handy when we come to, to start testing that. Um, and they're the type of fuse which, which sort of ping down and indicate that they've blown as well, so you don't actually have to go and hunt for the one that's, that's popped. Um, there's a, there's a, a supply voltage and um, uh, a, a tester which can be switched to various uh, HT rails as a quick check. Um, there's the rectifier unit and the stabiliser unit. Now those two units there are used uh, for the, um, the, the arithmetic rack and for the HT for the, for the, for the decatrons. Um, Yeah, the, the, the cam I told you about with the, the produces the 30 second pulses is also within the, uh, within the control unit. Um, our biggest, oh sorry, around the back of here are, are two further units which are 120 volt DC supplies for the, for the Creed equipment which I mentioned earlier. Um, our first challenge was to get the, the stabiliser unit, sorry the rectifier unit working. Um, now we noticed that it had suffered um, Actually, I'm just wondering if that's, if that's next in my sequence. Oh, sorry, we'll come on to that in a bit out, out of step. I mentioned that um, the machine's controlled by uh, primary and secondary sequences, and they are actually implemented by that particular set of relays there. I thought I'd uh, show you one with a, with a can off just so you can see what's inside. Most of them are the, are the um, Post Office 3000 series relays. Uh, there's also the odd Siemens high speed relay amongst them as well. But another very good thing, each individual relay has uh, a designation on it so you can relate it directly to the schematics, which is, which is really good for fault finding and, and finding your way around the machine. Um, right, three, uh, another five relay sets which are very important are the, are the D sets. Um, basically when a, um, a, a, an instruction is read in to, uh, to the machine for execution. Um, it is read in as, f as five digits. Uh, the first digit is the opcode, if you like. Um, the second and third, in the case of arithmetic instructions, are the sending store, and the fourth and fifth are the receiving store. Now, so it loads the opcode, sending store, receiving store address uh, um, into these relays, and then uh, proceeds to, to execute. Um, without, get, without going into the, in, into the machine in great detail technically, um, I, I would refer anyone who, who has an interest in, in, in how it actually performs arithmetic uh, exactly to uh, an article which was written by uh, the three designers um, in 1951, I believe. Yeah, um, which, which is extremely, 
informative. Um, and of course, the schematics and notes that I've shown you earlier, we've scanned them all and they're available on the Computer Conservation Society website, which Kevin maintains. Computer. Oh, right, yes, computer, right, yes. <laughs> yes. Right, uh, you've already met Eddie. This, this is Eddie mod mod modelling a dummy load for the power supply. Um, that's his genuine post office lamp. Uh, it's not a brilliant photograph, but then we don't have many photographs of Eddie, so that, uh, that'll have to serve. Um, I, I wasn't sure whether he'd be here in person today, so I had to slip that in. Um, it, basically, uh, a lot of the, I'll say, unsung, but uh, in, in the blogs, I, I'm, I'm always just saying, and Eddie's cleaned some more relays, and Eddie's changed some more contacts every week after week after week. Um, Eddie, being a, a retired post office engineer, used to do this full time for a living and enjoyed it so much that he's come back to do it in his retirement. So, uh, <laughs> this is typical of the kind of problem that, that Eddie's had to face. There's a lot of build up of. Um, of, of, of crud on the, <laughs> on the pole faces and on the armatures. Um, also, um, uh, another type of problem that, that Eddie's regularly dealing with are bad, uh, maladjusted spring sets on relays where someone has gone in with the pliers and bent the, bent the spring to, to adjust them rather than making uh, adjust, adjustments to spring tension and so forth. I don't claim to be in any way an expert on, on relays and we're very grateful to have any assistance on the project really because uh, I think we'd have been struggling with the relays. Um, it, it's certainly worth, it should be to be invaluable having Eddie going through, someone who knows what they're doing, um, to go through and, uh, and check check all the relays and of course there are plenty of them. I think you've almost completed that now Eddie, haven't you? So, excellent. So it'll work first time. <laughs> this is Eddie's workbench. That's the, the shift unit which uh, which is just completed um, cleaning, ready to go back, rack, back on the rack. Right, back to the power supply. Yeah, I, I started talking about the stabilizing. Basically, before we could really do any testing of the machine in anger, um, we need a power supply. And it's one of those machines which has so many different supply rails. Um, I can't really list them all. Uh, there's plus 370 for the for the Decatron anodes, there's a plus 250 for the valve supply. Then there are various negative bias voltages, um, uh, and you've got, your, you've got your separate supplies for the relays and uh, the crude equipment and so forth. So we, we need um, a working power supply first. <coughs> and that's where Johan comes in. Um, Johan's been working on the 50 volt uh, relay supply, which we've had working. It makes quite a um, an interesting noise, it buzzes, the choke really buzzes, it's like an electricity substation when it's running. Um, it's also um, incredibly inefficient, it has a, a, a rear stat connected across the output as, as a crude voltage stabiliser and you can feel, feel the warmth coming off it when it operates. We've had to revise our initial estimates of the power consumption of the machine, although it does have a, effectively a three pin plug on, so um, you know, we, we know we're uh, not going to run the electricity bill up too much, certainly not as much as Colossus. Um, so what, what Eddie's actually doing at this point here is fitting a, a, an extension to the fuses on the front so that we can just use uh, small cartridge fuses rather than having to re rewire it every time. Um, and he's able to fit, fit that on existing um, studding which is protruding from the, the front of the unit uh, so it doesn't actually involve making any modifications to the um, to the power supply. One thing we did do though, um, it has a bank of four electrolytic capacitors dated 1947 and we thought we're not even going to go there. So um, we took those out of circuit and adjacent to them we've put a modern, uh, modern capacitor uh, to do the same job but it's, it's, it's obvious by looking at it that that's exactly what we've done and um, whenever we carry out any restoration activity we write it up in our project log book um, it will get loaded onto the document management system of the museum and it will probably end up on the blog, which I'll, I'll provide more details about later on. Uh, right, oh yes, around the back I mentioned there were two 120 volt DC supplies. Um, I didn't really have to do a great deal with those. A, a lot of the restoration work <laughs> that we've done has really been 
brushing away grime, wiping it down with a, with a damp cloth and just generally cleaning it up. Um, the, the, the picture that Kevin showed of the computer at, um, at Birmingham's first, um, Charlotte Street, was it? Yeah, at, at the Charlotte Street store. Um, we reckon a lot of the work that we've, we've done has, or that, we, that needs to be done is due to problems that, that occurred during storage where it's been stored in a, in a damp environment. Um, we've had a lot of buildup of rust, a lot of rusty screws, that sort of thing. So um, I'll, I'll, come, I'll talk about how, how we're dealing with that shortly. Oh, there's, there's an example of the kind of perished rubber insulation that we've had to deal with on the wire. Um, we've been taking that out. Anything that we take off the machine, we bag up and store, just in case anyone's interested in the future. Um, we've been replacing that with modern um, cable, basically, for safety. There's an old radio specs capacitor that's seen better days, and that's been replaced with a modern one. That's a before shot of um, perished insulation and the general state of, the, of that part of the unit. And there we are after it's been cleaned up. We have to replace um, some uh, broken contacts in, in one of the fuse holders as well. But you know, they're, they're, they're working fine now. So we haven't, we haven't connected up with an angle voice lamp as a, as a W node. Right, the, the distribution and monitor unit. I'm just going to whiz ahead, white right armor. Um, that is part of the, um, uh, the rectifier unit, which you saw a second ago. Um, these wire wrap resistors had blown. Well, all of the four of them, three of them had blown, which was just as well that the other one happened, because that's how we, we found out what the value of the other three was. Um, so that, that was handy. Um, the, these copper oxide rectifiers had already been taken out of circuit at some point in the past. Um, but they look rather impressive, and uh, so we haven't we haven't disturbed. We basically we've cleaned it up, but left the front of the machine looking just the way it is. But what we have done is put a, a small um, panel uh, on the inside of the unit with uh, with modern uh, resistors and replaced um, blown rectifiers with um, uh, modern silicon rectifiers. That's the state of the. Uh, the, 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 the supply before we started doing anything with it. Um, basically, on doing a quick inspection of the components with a, with a meter, it was evident that this choke here, which is the, um, the choke in the 370 volt supply, HD supply, had, had, had gone open circuit. Um, it had obviously, over a period of time, been operated at a really high temperature um, because pitch had, had obviously reached its uh, vapor point, which uh, don't know what that is, but it, it, had got, it, had, it had sort of condensed all over the place and leaked out. Uh, all the rubber grommets, which were already perished, had kind of dissolved into a gooey slime. And the, only, and the wiring was covered in pitch as well. So really the only thing to do with that, uh, because of the aggressive solvents we'd need to clean the, the metal uh, underneath, was to, was to dismantle it completely and rebuild it, which is what we did. Right, that's just a, in the process of being dismantled. Horrendous. That's, um, is that before or after? Yeah, that's, that's actually a before shot. The underside wasn't too bad, but you can see round about where there are holes, um, where the grommets were, how the pitch has come in underneath the unit. Right, um, part of the, well, one of the fun tasks that we had was to, to repot um, the choke because we were able to find a spare choke in uh, in one of our um, buildings where we store a lot of uh, a lot of old old kit, and in fact we've been able to come up with uh, with a lower space for the machine from from um, uh, components that have been collected during the Colossus rebuild project. Um, that's my pitch pot. <laughs> uh, one of the volunteers had melted out the pitch from the old transformer and and kept it, so we. Uh, basically repotted the new transformer using the existing pitch. So uh, that was quite fun because I did that in, uh, in the alcove of one of the huts during a blizzard um, to keep out the wind. And uh, I had my camping stove with the pitch pot on top and some, some pliers and it kept catching fire. And of course, <laughs> it was easy to put out, but uh, it was still quite exciting. It's a shame somebody wasn't there to, uh, to take some photographs. That's the repaired choke, uh, which has been 
um, we, we had to drill out the rivets, obviously, to, to, to get the oil component out. But that's now ready to be replaced back into, the, into, into its position. An interesting thing at this point, and the reason I took this photograph was because what's evident is that there was another chip. Obviously, somebody's had the problems with this in the past because um, this, this doesn't look like it was the first choke in, in, in the machine. Um, obviously, these holes there were for a one with a different, uh, different footprint. footprint. Um, two more blown resistors, which we replaced with modern equivalents. And there is the, the, the rebuilt uh, power supply, looking much cleaner. This is the board I was telling you about, uh, with, with modern resistors on and um, uh, silicon diodes there. We've also got um, some replacement capacitors here. Uh, and, and, the, and it's been rewired using exactly the same colour scheme, wiring, routing, and so forth as the original. Um, yes, actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll mention, we, we targeted electrolytics because they're just bad news over, over time. Um, there's a lot of um, nitrogol, uh, dubillier nitrogol capacitors, um, which we've had no problems with. Um, we've actually powered quite a few of those, and I'll come on to something that I built with, with those, which, um, using ones that we, again, from our store, which haven't been used for 18 years, uh, no, prob no problem at all with those. They seem to stand the test of time. As we dummy loads, uh, to test the power supply, I, I, I made a, a rough um, estimate of the kind of, of, of current that would be likely to, to be drawn based on the annotated schematics and um, uh, finger in the air, I suppose. And, and that's what I came up with as a dummy load. So we, we were able to, to run it under test for a while. The load. Another thing we did, because I mentioned there was a lot of damage to, um, to metal work, uh, both uh, this chrome is, is pitted with, with rust. Um, we, by passing electric current through, um, uh, through it and, and using a, a vat of, well, that's actually just water with a bit of washing soda uh, dissolved in it. Um, it's possible to, to remove the, the rust. Uh, what you do is you, you place a number of, you can just see these wires hanging out there, or, which are hanging on, a, on bits of uh, copper wire. Uh, and they have, um, I think, sort of three or four inch um, iron nails hanging on them, which are sacrificial anodes. So basically, to cut a long story short, the rust comes off there and goes onto the nails. Oh, lovely. Yes. And there are the nails afterwards. Best place for the rust. Right. This is this is a before shot. If you, this is basically just mirror finish now. Um, and that's just from removing, the, removing rust without disturbing any of the, of the metal. It's the same technique that um, archaeologists use for um, restoring um, or cleaning up coins that they find where they're desperate to uh, preserve the, um, the, the pattern on the coin, the stamping. Um, it's also, I, I picked up this, this technique from, from Graham Wallace who's restoring uh, punched iron card equipment and has, made, um, has put this technique to, technique to good effect to clean up um, the metal work on that. You can also, as well as dip, dipping things in the vat, you can make little probes and, and actually attack sort of screw heads and so forth um, to remove rust as well. Although we haven't actually gone through and done that sort of level of, uh, of restoration yet, we're, we're really concentrating on doing what's necessary to get the computer into a safe and reliable working order at the moment. Um, that's actually the front of the of the, of the stabilizer unit, which, which sits at the top of the power supply rack. Right, you mentioned about um, paper capacitors. We've got a lot of those in the in, in, in the in the stabilizer unit there. We have powered up the stabilizer unit. There wasn't a lot that we needed to do to it actually, um, but we're having a problem with one of the um, one of, with part of it where uh, a valve's drawing too much current, but. We've actually put that on hold for a while because we don't actually need that part of the power supply. I'll, I'll come on to what we are actually doing uh, uh, in a second. That's an underside, underside view of it. Right. <clears throat> we decided that um, we had an awful lot of decatrons, basically, and we, we had no idea what sort of condition they were in. Um, the decatrons that are used in the, in the, in the Harlow decatron computer are primarily uh, of type GC10A, 
which were the first Decatron that um, uh, Ericsson produced. Uh, they actually patented the Decatron in 1949, which was the uh, design of this machine commenced. And so, uh, obviously, that this was uh, this was all new technology, which uh, which was being applied. Now, um, we're not sure what the exact gas fill of these Decatrons was. Uh, Gurney Thomas, who was responsible for for designing these, um, uh, remembers them glowing a lot brighter than the ones that we've had on test do. Uh, so it's possible that it was perhaps helium, which is outgassed through the glass over over all these years. Um, but anyway, we decided to, to, to basically get a store cleaned up and, and powered up. And so um, that all went very smoothly. And so I thought, well, we're on a roll here, so why not just carry on and get all of the stores working? And um, in order to actually display the, the stores on the machine, uh, we realised that we had rack issues to deal with as well, the wiring, there'd been a lot of damage, but I'll come on to that shortly as well. Um, Oh, there's one missing there. <laughs> just noticed that. Um, basically, a store, just to give an idea of, of how it actually works, comprises a store unit comprises ten stores. Um, so each horizontal row here is a, a bit like a memory in a programmable calculator. It will store a sign, uh, a single digit, a fixed decimal point, and then seven decimal places if it's storing a number. Um, we're not sure exactly how orders are stored in the store yet. Um, and, and basically an entire store can either be in send mode, in which case this green light would be on, or in receive, which, in which case the red light would be on. So if you're going, you can't in one calculation send and receive two stores in the same store unit, you need to use two, um, two stores for that. Um, and, and whichever store is selected by means of, the, of, of these relays here, these ones here, the, 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 there are the ones that are used for selecting receive, ones for selecting send, and then each of these selects a particular store uh, lights up here. So there's a lot of visual feedback to aid with diagnostics, which is excellent. Um, <coughs> right, yes, yeah, so I've just mentioned that. <laughs> uh, yeah, stores are in send or receive. Um, Oh, good. Yes, I mean one of the great things that, that um, this machine is, as an educational tool is that you can actually see what is in the in the memory just by looking at it. You know, you can work out the position of the of, of, of the, the spot, the, the, the glow in the, in, the, in, the, in the store, to work out what's actually stored. And there is a, a decatron. We, we've actually built a, a few a decatron spinners, which is a trivial circuit, which um, takes. Uh, the mains uh, doubles the voltage, takes a sample of the uh, the AC from the mains, and uses that to to push the, the charge end. And so, with a double pulse decatron running off 50 hertz, um, it goes around two and a half times a second. Yes, um, <laughs> long exposure, it appears that they're all lit, but actually only one. Um, uh, the glow is only on one electrode at a time. Um, a faster exposure, <laughs> and, you, and you can see here that there are basically um, three glows. One of those will be, be a cathode. Basically, the, what, what you've actually got there, just at, uh, at the risk of going a bit technical, um, you've got a central anode, um, which is always uh, has the HT applied. You've then got 30 electrodes, 10 of which are cathodes, and between each pair of cathodes, you've got two guide electrodes. Uh, which we call G1, G2. So it goes cathode, G1, G2, cathode, G1, G2, cathode, G1, G2, and so forth all the way around. Um, so if, if it glows on one cathode by, by going, by taking the next guide negative and then the next one negative in rapid succession, you can entice the glow across onto the next cathode. And um, so normally the, 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 the guide electrodes sit at plus 60 volts and are taken to minus 60 to, to move the. Uh, the glow around. Yeah, there, there are uh, um, two different types of decatron tubes, basically. Um, the, well, the, the, there were ones which, which, which had 10 electrodes, sorry, t there, were, there were 10 cathode decatrons, 11, 12, and so forth, but all of the ones in, in, in this computer are 10, um, 10 cathode decatrons, uh, and, and therefore um, they, they can hold values 
uh, well, ten, ten, different, um, ten different digits. Um, selector tubes have all of the pins brought out to cathodes, whereas counter tubes don't. And you basically count in pulses and then count out whatever is stored in them. So if you put three pulses in, you've got to basically go around a, a further seven to get, to get a pulse out. Um, I mentioned the GC10A Decatron, which is the original one. Um, they, they are virtually unavailable now. Um, I think two or three are known to exist in the, in the collector's community, and we have about 800 of them. Um, <laughs> we, we, found we found testing them that, um, that, that basically we, 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 we connect the variac to one of these spinners, and you wind it up till it starts to spin, then start backing it off and look for signs of it wanting to stick on a particular cathode. Um, and, and we're not sure to what extent that will present a problem in running in, in normal operation of the machine. So we've been trying to avoid any uh, uh, repopulating stores with any decatrons which show signs of, of sticking. Um, so, so we can come back to that, that issue at, at a later date. And we've also been looking at ways of, um, uh, of restoring decatrons um, that are suffering from sticking. Typically, if a decatron is left in the same position for a long period of time, uh, you, get, you get ionization build up around the, uh, the cathode. But there are ways of, 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 of dealing with that which are well known to the hard valve um, enthusiasts. So um, we'll, we'll try to, to make use of those. But anyway, the, the, um, the tube I show you, showed you that was illuminated there was a neon filled, a GC10B. Now they're much more readily available. Um, and we've had a number donated actually um, to, to help with the project. We've, we have actually sufficient of them to completely populate one store. But when using it um, in, um, with visitors and trying to demonstrate what's going on, we want some fairly bright tubes in some of the receiving and sending stores and in the accumulator so we can demonstrate calculations that people can see, uh, basically. Um, all right, I've already described how, how it's organized. Um, basically, only, only one cathode strikes, fortunately. Um, and once it's, that prevents uh, further cathodes from striking. So only, the glue is only in one position at a time, basically. And I've already described how you can uh, apply negative pulses to, to, to move the glue along. Right, this is, this is the underside of a store. Um, in general, um, they're in pretty good order. The, the, the problems, there are two problems that we've had with these stores, um, and they're both related that within the store, there is an internal frame which has the U-points mounted on it. Now, the frame is made of, uh, of two uh, fairly, I say weak, but um, less substantial pieces of metal than the frame itself. Now, whether they've been, it looks like somehow they've been compressed, um, which has pushed these, which has bent these parts of the frame and pushed them into the back of some of the components, which are now hard up against the, the valve holders. And, some of the, um, the diodes, these uh, Lucas center cell diodes, um, have broken. Fortunately, um, um, John Harper was able to provide us with some replacements, which we've put to, uh, to good use there. Um, and we've also straightened out, uh, dismant partially dismantled and straightened out the network. It was also preventing um, the store from sitting properly on the rack. Uh, it needs to engage with the mounting holes and sit in, in the U-points correctly. And of course, having been bent, um, it, it, was, it was not wanting to do that. On the right hand side, there's broken resistors, there's pairs of resistors. Um, right, on the back of each decatron, this is probably a bit of um, time to explain the circuitry slightly. It's all repeated. The back of each decatron is like, exactly the same. You've got a 1 mega ohm anode resistor, um, and you've got two gating diodes, basically. So each of these is a, is a diode. Um, uh, what we've had to do is just pull them slightly away from the, the base where they've been compressed so we don't end up with shorts. Um, I did have a short on one of the stores, um, which I was able to find with a, a low ohms meter, where basically uh, I was just localising where, where the short to, to the frame was. Um, so that was, a, that was a handy technique to use. Sorry, does, does that answer your question? Yes, I mean, the, the, oh. the two, I suppose you use one broken resistor rather than... Um, they, they, do look like, they do look like resistors, but these are actually diodes. They're, they're like a, I think they're point contacts, lenium. Um, it's, it's not a type that I've used before, to be honest. 
uh, but we do have a data sheet for them and uh, some spares, which is, uh, which is good. Actually, they've used these, they've used a number of different types of diodes in the machine, in, in, the, in the stores in various places, um, evidently to do, to, to do repairs. Now, we've been going around um, testing them all, and anything that's broken or that doesn't behave like a diode, um, that we're replacing. Typically, there may be three or four in a store that need replacing, but only on stores where, which have been physically damaged have we found broken diodes. Oh, that, that, this is exactly the kind of testing. There's another type of, of diode there. And we've been making use of, um, of the usual sort of tracker um, idea of, 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 of passing um, an AC supply uh, across, across the component. And according to the shape you get on the scope screen, you can tell that's a, that's a diode. If it was a resistor, you'd get a, a line. If it was a capacitor or a copper inductance, you'd get a, an oval or a circle or a combination. Because the, the beauty of that is you can, you can test components in circuit. And it, it's very useful for identifying problems. Right, that, this, is, uh, you know, this is something I built with some of those capacitors that you mentioned earlier, uh, paper capacitors. Basically, we needed a quick, quick and dirty 370 volt supply to test stores. And so using bits and bobs that were lying around, I, I put that together, which is a bit scary, but it, it serves its purpose in, in the short term. Right, there, there's a, a picture of, of some um, of Decatrons, which one of our volunteers, uh, Peter Vaughan, took. Um, it, it took a lot of attempts to, to get uh, that. The problem is that these original decatrons glow so faintly, we've actually got blinds around um, the, the restoration area to try and reduce the, the, the ambient light so that uh, photographers get a better chance of, uh, of taking a picture. Um, but that, we were really masking out every little bit of light that came in, you know, putting black boards up against the windows and, and so forth to, to get those pictures, um, to get them that bright. But you, they are a lilac colour, and we do actually have a colour slide that came with the computer, a small box of coloured slides in that, in that big goodies crate that I, uh, we showed you earlier, um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the machine, obviously in operation, because you can just pick out um, um, glows on the tubes. Right, um, decatrons. The, the, where, this is a GC10A Decatron, one of the original uh, Ericsson tubes uh, that the machine is largely populated with. Now, in certain places, they have uh, replaced these with the GC10Bs, which indicates to us that uh, they are broadly comparable. Unfortunately, we don't have a data sheet for the GC10A. All we've been able to ascertain is that the GC10A has a lower striking voltage than the GC10B, but then it's a lot dimmer and um, well, the other problem we've had is that we've had, we've had bases coming off and we've had to use lacquer to, uh, to reattach them. So the, these are the two types that we use in the machine, the two types of counter tube. Um, they're both fairly, well this is virtually impossible to come by, and these ones are, are, are quite rare. Uh, but what is readily available are, um, is the Russian OG4 Decatron, which is suspiciously similar to the GC10B Decatron. Uh, but it's a short stubby valve and it has a different pinout. So Kevin actually bought a load of these on eBay just for us to do something with. And, and what, what I did with, with, with him was to, to take a, um, a, a broken valve base off an old Colossus valve and to effectively use that to map the, the pinout of, uh, of this tube to the pinout um, of this. So now that is a, basically a plug-in replacement for that. So if we, if we can get those, then that will solve our long-term um, Decatron problems. Brushing, a uh, pretty boring photograph, but it's representative of, of what we do. Brushing um, dirt off contacts prior to, to giving them a, a more thorough clean. You can see the rust damp here on the screws that I mentioned from storage. Um, there's a, I mean, we could be, we could spend a lot of time going through removing rust from the machine, but then it, it wouldn't look like an old computer. Um, so, and also, it, 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 it's not our principal objective, uh, which is to get the machine working. <coughs> right. um, <coughs> perished rubber grommets I mentioned earlier. We've got perished rubber sleeving. Even the PVC wire, well, there's some soldering iron damage there, but the PVC has gone brittle. Even though it looks superficially okay, the, uh, the plasticizers used in the PVC have, have, have obviously 
uh, leached out over time and uh, <coughs> it is quite brittle. Also, because of the way that they've strung these wires like harp strings across exposed areas, they're very susceptible to mechanical damage and therefore uh, we've had to uh, make the decision to rewire uh, two of the racks, um, rack five and rack four, which are the two racks with, with Decatron tubes on. But we've, we're using PVC wire, um, same wiring pattern, same colour scheme. Um, one thing that is very fortunate actually is the original wire on the machine, um, the, the, the neat trunking of, um, of, of, of silk and cotton covered wire, which fortunately doesn't contain any rubber, um, it is in very good condition and therefore we, we won't need to touch that at all apart from where it terminates to, bro to broken connectors which, which we've had to replace. Like this. <laughs> That's an example of some mechanical damage that's occurred to the front where part of this U point has sheared off, uh, the, 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 hold, the screw that holds onto the frame is sheared off. <coughs> Same story here, uh, cables broken. Um, fortunately, the, the wiring of, 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 the, of the, uh, the store units is quite straightforward. It's like a large matrix, basically. And so, um, and, and of course, having the schematics is a great help. But um, it's, it, we have no problems with you know, being confident that we're correctly uh, rewiring these. Oh, and there's some that's been rewired. Uh, in fact, that's the same, same viewpoint, but, but with the replaced. Uh, replace. Again, um, we had viewpoints um, that had been collected as part of the spares for, for the Colossus project, so uh, we've been very lucky with spares on, on this project so far. There's a rear view of the machine. <laughs> Um, I, I, I did, did this basically because it shows the, nice, the, the, the shiny um, uh, chrome work following the electrolytic removal of rust. Um, I've also pulled up an extra rack which we, which we had on site uh, so that I could work on the, on the rectifier unit separate from the power supply rack because it's, it, it's much easier to access underneath it and on top uh, when, it's, when it's working. Uh, and that's the rack that I'm currently rewiring. These are the store racks to the right of, of my hand there. Uh, I've completed rewiring these ones, which we've had powered up, and uh, I'm now working on this one. The plan is, at the moment, to, um, I'll show it to the plan is to complete the rewiring of these units and to get all the stores um, restored, and then to build the store exerciser, which will work through uh, operating the relays, the lamps, and so forth, as if the computer were controlling the, the, the whole of the store. Um, obviously that's going to be really great to look at visually, uh, but uh, it's also going to provide us with useful information about any residual faults in, in the stores that we've worked on. So that's, that's what we're up to at the moment. And uh, partial rewiring in progress. It's, there's method in the madness, that's all I can say for that picture. <laughs> Wanted, yes, I had to get a plug in. We've been, we've been very um, we've been very encouraged by the response we've had from the, the, the British and the American valve enthusiasts and collectors sort of associations, and they've um, advertised on their website lists of valves that we're looking for, um, and, and this is typical of the kind of, uh, of, these are the ones we particularly would like to get hold of. These trigger tubes are very rare as well. And um, we, we've had um, donations of, of all of these types, actually. Yeah, you know, so, um, uh, you know little, little packages arrive in the post every other week, which is, which is really good. So if anyone knows of any stashes of these anywhere, we'd, we'd really like to know about it. Um, I refer you to, if you're interested in, in following anything that I've been talking about up or anything that Kevin's been, been talking about, um, on the Computer Conservation Society website, uh, we, Kevin maintains a, a page um, under www.computerconservationsociety.org, which uh, in which is um, uh, uploaded various uh, materials that he's collected over, over the time he's been researching the machine. Um, I also maintain a, a blog every week or so, depends what's happening, <laughs> um, on the pro project uh, Progress, which is on our uh, the National Museum of Computing website. Um, it's probably easier just to, to navigate to www.tnmoc.org and then follow the projects link. Um, I think well, that's almost done. Yep. Okay. What's the format now? Uh, I, I, 
Okay. 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 That's right, yes. Uh, yeah. is, is the hardware here doing? Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'll just, uh, let's get this going again. F5. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, fair way, actually. Yeah, you mentioned about, about that, um, comparing parts of the machine, relating the two together. Um, if we think of the, the pulse generator, which is actually um, this box here, that's effectively turning the handle. The accumulator, sorry, it was remiss of me not to, I, I did actually mean to, to describe this. Um, the accumulator is split into two units here. There's a, there's a shift unit here, which effectively moves the carriage. Yeah, it, it's like a big relay switching matrix. In fact, the schematics quite a work of art because you've got all these diagonal lines built in both directions. Um, uh, so that, that's basically the unit that's doing, uh, that, that's performing that. It was the one on Eddie's workbench with, 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 with a hanky over it. So. But the answer would have been that. Uh, yes. Um, it basically, uh, if I went back to the slide describing the store, you select the whole store. So, so that's all happening in parallel. It's yeah, it's not doing that tube and then not tube that tube. Yeah. Oh, good grief! I, I couldn't answer that off the top of my head, but it, it does perform the, the shift operation. It's a multi-stage operation of repetitive subtraction and, and, and shifting, much as in the same way as multiplication is repetitive addition and shifting the other way. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, but I can't. I, I, I couldn't answer that off the top of my head. The chap who actually designed it is sitting right behind you, so he might, do, <laughs> might be able to, to help you. Uh, <laughs> Any more? John? Uh, I want to add something to the uh, earlier uh, comment that the uh, US stole the British share of the uh, nuclear, uh, through a massive nuclear research in the war. prototype made of the machine to, to test the, uh, the principles on a very, very small scale, I believe. Um, but the following from that, at, at Harwell, they then went on to, to the cadet, produced a cadet computer with uh, germanium point contact transistors rather than, which is an entirely different technology to, to this machine. The um, RAE um, farm group started developing something called the Rascal computer, which was using Deptron stores and relay based. And that was subsequently taken over by by Plessy, um, but events overtook it completely because they were actually finished. But that was going to be a Decatron based computer. The the, the application of uh, of Decatron technology to projects at Harwell. Uh, one of our uh, visitors who used to work at Harwell back in his, uh, I think he did his student placement there or something like that a long time ago, was saying they're using Decatrons for for pulse counters where you're counting pulses of different amplitudes. Um, through some kind of window detector and, and tallying the number of, of, of pulses. So they were making use of, you know, they've been looking at this technology for other purposes, and uh, this was simply one, one of the projects that, 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 that um, Gurney Thomas was involved with applying his uh, knowledge of decatrons. If, if the main point of decatron was that one of the points was glowing, how did the, the rest of the, the system know 
Which one was that? Ah, because yeah. when you um, uh, yeah, I see. I see. How that could be tricky. Basically, um, it, it can be in ten states. So what, what you actually have from the pulse generator is, is a train of ten pulses uh, with a, sort of on for one and a half milliseconds, off for one and a half milliseconds. You've got a train of ten pulses, and then another train which is offset by half a you know 180 degrees out, which pulses it round. So if you pulse a number in with ten pulses, and then you send a, a pulse train in to count a number out. You, you can see by the, the voltage on the cathode, it suddenly changes. So ah, you've, that, that you've got your you've got the your glow there. Brought out. Actually, Dick's probably Dick. a better answer. Dick. It might be the microphone actually. You need the microphone. I, I think that Tony, what you were to say was that the, the, the crux of this this question about how you know where the glow is is that. One cathode is brought out separately, and the other nine cathodes are all linked together. So, to find out where the glow is, you drive it round until you find it's arrived at the unique. Yes. The yeah. that's, that's basically the difference between a, a counter tube and a selector tube. The selector tube, all of the cathodes are brought out, so you can tell, without actually doing anything to the tube, you can tell what the value is, whereas with a counter, you've got to, because it's hidden somewhere in the, t in the tube, you've got to count it out, or count and count it back in again. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you imagine the tube, if it's not, let's say the third one is a light, if you send it ten pulses, at the end of the third one, it's still just a light. But you get that pulse as it passes the uh, cathode that's brought out, then it's got three on your store. After you put seven pulses in, you get a pulse. So you've already got a complement, you've got seven. And then you just count the number of um, additional pulses up to the 10, and that tells you what's in the store. That's actually a very handy feature because in the, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the logic which basically performs the addition, it can either take the, the complement or the original value. So you know, just by swapping it over, you, you can add or subtract. Oh, yeah. Just on decatrons, I worked probably some time after it. Decatrons were very common in nuclear setups because lots of counter instruments and particularly counter instruments, they were <coughs> seeing what really good contamination. Oh. Yeah. So uh, and that, that was at the way in the late 50s. Today, by the way, is the national position. You mentioned lists of monuments, good <coughs> Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think yeah. just going back, back to that, and I, I, I remember sort of Decatron tubes in counters with global mm -hmm. tubes. It was, and my initial reaction, thinking about this machine, was, ah, yes, uh, oh, well, they have used global mother tubes and counters, therefore they knew what Decatrons were about, and that's why they used Decatrons for this machine. But at the time, that <coughs> was not the case at all, because they must have been using Decatrons or tubes, thinking about using Decatron tubes when this machine was designed, in parallel, in parallel with doing now on counters and so on, we can't be that. We have been offered, um, a gentleman offered us a, um, a, a scintillation counter or, or something of that nature, um, as, a, as a, something we'd have on, de on demonstration to the, to the public. We actually have an old lab gear uh, time interval counter which uses about six decatrons, um, which I'm in the process of restoring to have on display as well. So yes, we're, we're aware of the, uh, uh, we're trying to get exa other examples of, of the use of decatrons um, uh, at the museum to, to demonstrate to people other, other, other applications of the technology. You only have a book for one model. There's only a book for one model, little bit. Yes. Yes, it was unique. <laughs> Dan? Oh, sorry, there's a. No, no, drop. No, no. Oh, um, as, as the Scotsman in the audience. Any idea how much it cost? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have to defer to Dick again if you can remember how much, he, how much the budget was to develop the machine. Sorry. I think the answer is that um, if you had, at the time, really wanted to find out, you would be able to, you would have been able to, uh, to find some number, but in fact uh, that was not really that was not really of the essence 
because this was aside from the from from the main business of electronics division, which was producing uh, instrumentation for uh, for use in laboratories and the field, and, and what really mattered was uh, where are you, where are you getting the right instruments out in the field, manufactured, supported, uh, in use. Um, a, a, a thing like this, which was a kind of a demonstration standing to one side of that, and if you really twisted people's arms, they would say, they would have to say that its interest was, uh, was really seeing uh, how well these these new and virtually unknown components would stand up in in use in in, in quantity and over a period of time. Um, you, you really couldn't quanti quantify that. Um, I mean, the, the three of us who were working as designers on this had other jobs on the go at the same time, um, and. Uh, I don't think the management would have been um, terribly keen on, uh, on, on um, disclosing exactly what proportion to designing this window circuitry as compared with designing the, the circuitry of, of automating tedious uh, laboratory. Anyway, your top, your top management had other, other things to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to add how long these Decatrons seemed to last, because I think 1961, it seemed to still be well, in thing for a frequency meter. Well, Decatrons were widely used throughout the 60s, sorry, throughout, throughout the 50s and into the early 60s as the preferred method of, of counting at low frequencies. The, the, the fastest you can um, sort of clock on these tubes <coughs> is about 4 kilohertz. Um, there were types of decatrons that came out that would work a lot faster um, uh, later on, but um, the, the early decatrons didn't. And of course, other, other methods of counting were being developed that were much more cost-effective uh, than, than decatron tubes. So, so they lasted until the, the mid-60s. In chronological order, how did this relate in time to the Colossus and the Ace Pilots? Colossus had long since been gone by the Been and gone. Yeah, uh, Colossus was um, a small commission in 1943, yes. and in 1945, they'd all, all but two, two obviously went off to Cheltenham, but they'd all gone. And it's, it's superficially, I mean, that's the point, it's superficially, it looks like Colossus it actually has absolutely nothing to do with it at all. Ace, Ace Pilot followed Colossus because that was done by Turing, wasn't it? No no no, 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 sorry. It's a great model. Turing did not design Colossus. No, absolutely not. He just not. did not. It wasn't him. Colossus. Yeah. Yeah. And there is no connection between the four Colossus and the Battle of the Age. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Sorry. I'm <laughs> feeling very sensitive about what Turing did and what Turing didn't do. <laughs> well, with two more years, we've got your centenary, it's going to be worse now. <laughs>
CCS website that has got related to it and will have on it better in the future this sort of history. So, so in response to that question then, was this used for production pretty much straight away? Once it was handed over to the, the computer group, then a absolutely. Um, I mean, these are revolutionized their, their law. Even when they, were, they had later machines, this was still in, in regular use. I mean, not not for a, j just the same job as it was actually produced for, to produce these mathematical tables. David? In the, the, the Mark Twain book, Mark Twain was Whereas yeah. Colossus and earlier machines were running at half speed, much faster. One could say. So this is somehow a dinosaur. Uh, except this is a general purpose computer, Colossus. This, this is a Colossus. Yeah, no, but I mean from the from yeah. speed of it's, the It's chalk and cheese. Yeah. It's, it's true to say that the, the limiting factor in the speed of this machine is, is, is the VAL, sorry, is the relay electromechanical control, where obviously the, the, the pulse generator and the, the arithmetic circuits and the pulse and electrons works at a different um, order of magnitude of, of speed, really. Um, yeah, yeah, whereas Colossus is entirely valve, um, a hard valve, we need really, really good tape and so forth. So, it, but it is a special, as, it, as Kevin says, a special purpose computer. And then that's the last one. So this machine, when it operates, will make an interesting noise. Lots of It'll do lots of interesting things. Yeah, because um, <laughs> one, one of the first things that Dick came over when he saw uh, that we'd mounted these uh, tape streamers, sorry, these these tape readers on on the table, was I hope that's a strong table. Because apparently they, they sound like a machine gun. So I tell them, uh, along with that and the, the power supply that sounds like an electricity substation. Um, <laughs> You've got the relays clicking, and then of course the light show next to it will be quite a sight. Yes, I can't wait to see it work. <laughs> one, one really frustrating thing is when it makes a, a particular mission from Wolverhampton, a local television station, when it actually recorded in news, um, and I speak to the people that were actually involved in that recording, it looked fairly cheesy, it's sort of a will which enjoy its retirement and so on. And, and we think that that actual that 16 mil film is actually still in um, the, the museum centre in Birmingham. So at some point we need to go through and actually to find that, but that's <coughs> fantastic. But I'm looking forward to hearing it. Absolutely. I, uh, if I may just wrap this up and thank our speakers, uh, this project seems to me to be associated with cats. Uh, first of all, I have the image of Kevin sitting like a cat in front of the ticket market, and when this is all finished, he'll curl up with it. <laughs> <laughs> a purr like that. I'm not sure what Tony will do. But, um, and also, of course, a cat has nine lives. And you're on the fourth life now, perhaps? Depends how you count them. But you've got nine lives, remember. So you've got a few, you've got a few in hand. Thank you very much, both of you. I think it'd be actually fascinating. Thank you. I, I wish to add what a privilege it has been to have Dick Barnes here. The original person. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. It's normal I announce the next CCS talks. The next after this is on the 15th of April. Software development at Hursley, the first 35 years and beyond. Sounds like heavy going. <laughs> uh, that's kicks, isn't it? Yes. yes. That's kicks. And then in May, we are hoping. There'll be this Pegasus at 50 anniversary. We postponed it from last December because Pegasus has not been working since the summer, as you know, because of the fire it had. It's still not working at last, and we don't know yet whether it'll be working in May. So we're not sure. So let's watch this space. Uh, and that, anyway, that's the last of the season, and we have a program already lined up for you from September onwards. Thank you for coming. <laughs>